Welcome to Recollections, the Middle Tennessee Voice of Their Time series, a look at the past through the experiences of Middle Tennesseans. This is Bob Bullen of Middle Tennessee State University, and our guest is Theodore C. Bigger, retired college professor, World War II veteran, survivor of the Bataan Death March, and survivor of the Japanese prisoner of war camps in the Philippine Islands. This is a story of the human will to survive. Ted, welcome to the program. It's been over 40 years since that ordeal in the Philippines. Has time mellowed your attitude toward the Japanese? Yes, I think so. I uh, am of the opinion that uh, in order to hate, uh, it'll have a bad effect on you. And after a few years, I'd say 20, 25 years, something like that, I thought, well, to heck with it. I'll just uh, let them live and, and prosper. What about the plant in Smyrna. Does that bother you, the Japanese? No, not at all. I think that uh, it has helped this community and uh, people coming in to, well, both the Japanese people and the American people working together. Let's go back to the beginning. Let's talk about the Depression for a few minutes. What were you doing back in the 1930s? 1930, uh, of course, the year I finished high school. And um, I didn't uh, know what I was going to do, but I uh, had heard that there was a scholarship to Clemson at that time, it was Clemson Agricultural College, and now it's Clemson University. But uh, I didn't have anything else to do, so I went and took the examination. To my surprise, I got a scholarship, and I attended in the fall of 1930, and was graduated in 34. Was life hard for a student then that was in the depths of the Depression? Well, I don't suppose it was any harder for students uh, in that period of time than it was any other time. In fact, I, we've a little bit sheltered from the Depression in a way, if we could squander up the money. <laughs> well, how did you get into the military? Well. One of the things that uh, we had was, uh, it was a military school being a land grant institution at that time. And uh, I thought, well, if I'm going to have to drill anyway, I just will try to get an ROTC and uh, get paid for it. And, uh, which I did, and I was commissioned second lieutenant in the reserves when I was graduated. So what year was this? That was in 1934. All right, and you worked you worked in various teaching jobs during the 30s? Well, I, yes, I uh, worked at various teaching jobs uh, and uh, various other kind of jobs, but I was teaching vocational agriculture in the uh, late 30s and made the decision that if I was going to get anywhere, I had to have more education. and. Uh, so that was what I wanted to do, and that's what I did. And I started at Virginia Polytechnic Institute in the fall of 1940. And, and you were then called into the military? I received orders to report to active duty on uh, November 13th, 1940. Did you think war was rapidly approaching, or that that would uh, well, hold course, off Well, of course, yes, while? the war was already in progress in Europe. And uh, since we had radios uh, kept up uh, close attention to the war, and uh, was very much interested in what was going on in Europe. That was called the Phony War during that period of time. That's right. And it just so happened in the spring of 1940 that I had to make a decision, and that was to tell the uh, uh, superintendent whether or not I was going to return, and that decision had to be met in 1st of April. Well, when I made uh, my decision, there was nothing happening in Europe. It was just a uh, phony war. By graduation time, I did when school was out, and early part of June, uh, Dunkirk had already fallen, and so had most of France. So well, there you are. Well, once into the military and active duty, could you describe what life was like in the Army at that time? At that time, the military was uh, very pleasant. Uh, we had uh, work to do, but we also had uh, time off, and we uh, used that time to visit and uh, get acquainted with all the people. But a lot of people were coming in to active duty at that time. You were a captain at this time? No. 
I was the first lieutenant. But uh, it was a custom at that time to, uh, uh, it's all our uh, reserve, uh, was to do your homework, in other words, take extension courses. And uh, I completed all of them for the requirements for captaincy. And um, I, nothing happened until I was getting ready to sail for away from San Francisco and I was promoted to captain on the 30th and I sailed on November the 1st. That and was you, 40, uh, 41. 41 yeah. and you uh, sailed on the Calvin Coolidge, is that correct? That's right. It was a uh, part of the present line. It's a, it's a luxury liner. Comfortable accommodations on oh, the Oh yeah, ship. very nice. About 20 days to get to the Philippines? I suppose so. We got there on November 20th. I might say when we went through uh, Hawaii, we stopped there for about seven hours and uh, two of us went out to one of the posts, Army posts, and in our discussion, one fellow made the statement, said, you know, we've been having so many maneuvers around here, I believe if a real war came, we wouldn't know about it. We wouldn't so, recognize it. <laughs> so you saw the big battleships in the harbor right before, oh, yes. a few weeks before they were hit. Uh -huh. You remember much about what you saw in the harbor? Not a great deal. I didn't pay a whole lot of attention to the Army. I, uh, I was a little bit concerned about having to go so far away from home because I had looked on the map to see where the Philippines are, and they're way over towards China. A lot of talk about the war going over on the ship, that the Japs Not might... a great deal, no. No, no real fear at that time that the ja ja Japanese were about to attack? Well, we, we were concerned, and we knew of the possibility because China, the Japanese had been fighting in China for a good long while. And so uh, they had had a lot of experience in uh, maneuvering around. And of course there was some negotiation between the, uh, the diplomats, of this and that, but I mean, average person doesn't know what's going on in Washington. Well, you arrived in the Philippine Islands, I believe you told me about 18 days before Pearl Harbor. That's about right, yes. Uh, we got there on November the 20th, and, uh, and of course we crossed the international date line, so that made, uh, uh, let's see, we lost a day. Well, what happened during those 18 days? Just a lot of adjustment, getting used to your assignment, that sort of thing? Uh, my uh, responsibility was associated with the Air Corps Supply. I was an Air Corps Supply Officer, and uh, we had to do all types of work. I was with the 48th Material Squadron. And the duties of that squadron was to service or supply services for the uh, 27th Light Bombardment Group. Now, a group uh, consists of about four squadrons, or at least it did at that time. And uh, so that was my responsibility. And of course, if you were in responsible for all the supplies, like gasoline trucks and uh, other things. Then you check those things over and they come off the boat and a lot of things were missing, like uh, fire extinguishers and that type of thing. Do you say we were frantically preparing for war or going at it at a leisurely pace? I think we were frantically preparing for war. Uh, I think that uh, we had seen airplanes fly, uh, coming through uh, Savannah uh, Air Base, and I was in Savannah, Georgia, and uh, they were being painted uh, with the British colors. So we knew that uh, there was a war going on and we would be involved sooner or later. Well, December 7th, a day of infamy, and what happened on that day as far as you were concerned? Well, as far as December 7th is concerned, it was a very pleasant Sunday day in the Philippines, in Manila. Uh, since the international date line, uh, the occurrence of uh, at, at Pearl Harbor occurred, in, which was early in the morning, I believe, of Sunday. It happened early Monday morning, about 2.30 or 3 o'clock in the morning. So I didn't know anything about it until I turned on my radio Oh, about 7 o'clock, I guess, next morning, which was on the, December the 8th. And what kind of reaction took place in the Philippines after that? Can you just describe the situation? Well, you know, I don't know. I had a 
sort of a relieved feeling. I said, now, now I won't have to worry about all that equipment. <laughs> <laughs> and then when that wore off, <laughs> when I got that little bit off, then I thought, well, it's, it's going to be a long war. And was it just a day or so later the Japanese uh, attacked that the Philippine was only Islands? De- that was December the 8th, uh, and they attacked uh, Clark Field uh, around noon. Uh, they ha- they had also attacked other places earlier, uh, one of them being Baguio, uh, which I think was more or less to draw the uh, pursuit pilot or pursuit planes off the ground. Now, where is Clark Field in relationship to Manila? It's about uh, 60 kilometers, which would, uh, I don't know, you'd have to convert that over to miles, but it's uh, uh, about six tenths of a mile uh, per kilometer, okay. so. And a good bit of our Air Force was trapped on the ground, is that correct? We lost quite a few planes at that time. Uh, quite a few of them, yes. All, most all the pursuit planes. Uh, now, they didn't hit Nichols Field, and there were some pursuit planes there. They got those on Wednesday. But on that uh, Monday thing at Clark Field, they got a good quantity of the B-17s, which was a long-range bomber. Uh, about half of them were uh, in an island about 500 miles further south. Well, since you were with the Air Force branch of the Army, did you hear a lot of criticism as a result of those planes being caught on the field? Oh, yes. It was uh, quite a bit of uh, criticism. but. I think the uh, Germans had caught the Polish uh, planes on the ground. They'd caught the French on the ground. For some reason or other, didn't catch the German. I mean, the uh, English. I, I don't know whether they just didn't get up or just what. Maybe they were wise or so, but they caught us. Well, it, I guess it dawned on you. You were definitely in a war by this time, and could you describe the events that led to uh, you fellows being eventually uh, trapped on the Bataan Peninsula? Well, of course, when the war started, uh, the Japanese were all over the Pacific Ocean with their boats, particularly in that part of the uh, Pacific and the Southwest Pacific. In fact, uh, going back to a question you asked, how soon was it that they land? It first bombing on the Philipp- and the Philippine that is on the uh, Clark Field was on the eighth, then they landed on the tenth on the northern part of the island of Luzon and on the southern part. But the big invasion came on about the 22nd of December. And, and so they were in Manila by the end of the year, and I, they were pretty well almost there by Christmas. So it was a pretty rapid uh, retreat into the peninsula? Yeah, from Manila to Lingian Gulf. It's about 100 miles. So that's pretty fast walk. <laughs> you fellows were on the move then quite a bit. Well, I was in Manila, in Manila. Uh, or near Manila at Fort William McKinley, and uh, we uh, were ordered to Bataan Peninsula on Christmas Day. Did you go by boat? No, we went uh, by, we took all of our vehicles, and um, we went north to uh, San Fernando, Pampanga, uh, yes, Pampanga, and then south or sort of west to Bataan. Well, again, according to the, all the accounts that have been written, the Americans managed to get ample military supplies onto the peninsula, but somebody forgot about the food. And immediately we started having uh, supply problems with that. Did, did your group have a chance to get back into Manila and, and uh, get some supplies before you were trapped? Uh, yeah, we... Uh, we had two lieutenants there that uh, one was a mess officer and other uh, was some, I forgot now exactly what his responsibility was, transportation, I think. They went over to uh, Manila and they had a truck and uh, then they got another one over there. And uh, so they loaded those up with uh, supplies and came back. So we were fairly well stashed away, but that war went on for a while. We need to talk about numbers here, and uh, I believe at this time there must have been approximately 13,000 Americans on the Bataan Peninsula and maybe 70, 75,000 Filipinos? Something like that. Um, I've seen estimates uh, of the, uh, at the surrender, about 10,000. 
Some of the original ones did make it to Corregidor. I finally got to Corregidor, but 40 years later. <laughs> yes, I, I know <laughs> we want to talk about that before we finish. Well, three months, I believe, the fighting went on in Bataan, January, February, March, well, April, four, really all, it went into April, didn't it? Went into April. Uh, the, uh, it was, uh, being in the Air Corps, uh, very few of our men had any experience or any training as far as infantry was concerned. Now, in fact, we didn't have very much in the way of uh, rifles, but we did get those, and we each man had a rifle and uh, ammunition, and uh, we took them out to the firing range and let them fire about three rounds, or maybe five rounds, and uh, gave them some uh, instruction on that. And then we went on over to uh, Bataan. Could you describe the type of equipment the average soldier had? A lot of World War equipment, World it War was, I uh, equipment yes. still in use. I, I, the, the rifle was a Springfield rifle, which is a bolt action. And you put in a clip of five rounds. And, uh, of, uh, and then, uh, then uh, our helmets were the World War I helmet, the, the flat ones. And you'll see those, if you look at any books of uh, Surrender of Baton, uh, you'll see those helmets and picture. Uh, as far as ammunition and that type of thing, I think there was plenty of that uh, uh, on Corregidor and other places. We had plenty of that. Well, Corregidor is... You, you asked a previous question about other supplies, the food supplies. Uh, that question has been argued and uh, much has been said about it and I don't know exactly why they didn't get the rice back down in there and I know that uh, in our case we had Filipinos uh, that they were harvesting their rice at that particular time and they took it on with them back up into the hills. Could you describe uh, Bataan a little bit and give us a little bit about the geography and the defense line and give us a, a notion of what type of conditions you fellows were fighting in? Well, uh, Bataan Peninsula at that time, uh, there were a lot of rice paddies along, well, let me explain that the Bataan Peninsula is between the Manila Bay on the east side and uh, the China Sea on the west side. And it projects to uh, almost at, to uh, Corregidor, is sitting in the, in the mouth of the Manila Bay. It looks about like a tadpole. It's not a very big uh, a fort, but it was very effective. It the main purpose of Corregidor was to protect entrance into uh, Manila Bay. And uh, there's another story there about. The, bu the guns not being, they were all pointed out sea and not back towards the baton. I think they ran the same thing in down around Singapore. Singapore had the same yeah. problem, that's uh -huh. right. Well, the fighting became desperate and conditions became very harsh. Uh, what type of rations were you fellows on toward the end? Uh, we went on half ration about the middle of January. And uh, of course, we, our two truck load, we sort of supplemented that. And we had a very wise uh, a mess officer, and he kept his track as much as he could. So you were better off than the average soldier. In I your wouldn't. Case. I don't. I, I I sort of think so. Maybe. Could you describe what we mean by half ration? Well, half of what you were supposed to have been issued. Now, what were we issued? Uh, we started out with a regular a garrison ration. Uh, which would be canned meat and that type of stuff, but that soon gave out. And then uh, the uh, 26 cavalry, which uh, followed, uh, preceded, the, in other words, they were the rear guard to our forces all the way from Lingayan Gulf back to Bataan. When they got into Bataan, there was no need for using of uh, the horses any longer, so we ate the horses and. Uh, then there was a pack of uh, quartermaster pack train of mules, and then we ate the mules. And as things got a little bit rougher, we uh, started slaughtering the uh, Filipinos' cowbells, well, the water buffaloes. 
And as time got even worse, people back in the high trees, they started shooting monkeys. And uh, uh, protein was protein, and whatever was walking around on four legs would get shot. <laughs> Uh, what about dogs? People eat dogs? Yeah, so, uh, of course, Filipinos eat dogs all the time, but uh, <laughs> or they, they, they did then. I don't know what to do now, but uh, some of us ha ate Did you dogs. ever eat a monkey? I never did have that pleasure. What about but, a snake? Uh, yes, but at a later time. At a didn't, later time. Didn't we'll have we'll a get to that snakes then. at that time. And roaches? I think later on you had a nice yeah, diet of roaches. Yeah, that uh, in POW camp when we... Uh, we're after protein and regardless of the source. Well, as the men were uh, suffering from all types of exhaustion in a, in a weak diet, could you see a physical change in, in the men around you? Well, one of the things we started doing when we cutting that, cut down on the ration was they started losing weight. And uh, that's, of course, the secret to weight uh, control is to cut out the calories. <laughs> and, uh, but, uh, we had enough ration for, and of course Filipinos and a lot of us, we, we were eating rice too at that time, supplementing what we ate, other American food. Will you eat rice today? Well, yes, I, I still like rice. I didn't get enough then and I'm still trying to make up. <laughs> Let me ask you about uh, the heat. I understand it must be uh, uh, very intense over there along about April, the time that you fellas had to surrender. Uh, the Manila Bay area is roughly 15 degrees north of the equator. The most comfortable month uh, is, is uh, December, and possibly the most uh, hottest month is April. It's between the beginning of the rainy season and the uh, uh, dry season. Uh, there's no rain during uh, the winter months. A lot of humidity. Well, that close to the uh, to the bay and the ocean, there is some, yeah. But as you go at an elevation, it'd be reduced some. So Bataan's quite a bit of a mountainous area and jungle. Yes. Eventually, uh, it's a rice paddies yeah. along the coast. Eventually, your group was assigned to the front lines. Uh, that occurred um, along about the uh, eighth, I suppose, of January. We were put up on. We were at first in a secondary line, and then um, that was what they call the uh, Bagak uh, uh, Orion line, and that became the front line about the 26th of uh, January. So we were on the front line from then on until uh, we uh, the surrender. Were you involved in a lot of what they call firefights? A lot of exchange of. Uh, well, when we fire. when the uh, Japanese first came in, yes, we uh, we didn't see them. But we we could hear the their bullets uh, zipping by, and uh, it didn't take very long for a fellow to learn to duck his head. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, you don't have to have infantry training to uh, learn to keep your head down when things like that are going on. Now, I understand there was quite a bit of bombing later on in the strafing. Could you yes. describe that? Yes, they, uh, they, uh, uh, there was dive bombers all during the uh, uh, campaign, and those things would come in and they would uh, come down at an angle, and uh, if you could see the bomb, uh, you could see it, and then uh, pretty soon you only you didn't have to keep ducking in your. Uh, in your trench. So, uh, but later they brought in the uh, regular bombers, which flew the horizontal across us and then dropped these great big bombs. And they, <laughs> fortunately, in our squadron, there was no casualties. I believe you told me once of uh, looking up and seeing a bomb coming directly at you. Could you describe now this, that? Now, this was uh, on um, April the. Uh, Seventh, I believe, or eighth. I believe it could have been the eighth. I guess it was eighth. We were on a retreat. It had been for since the morning of the seventh. And um, this is April. April, yes. And uh, we had walked back a good long ways, and uh, 
Um, we were going across a narrow ridge to form a line, and as we uh, approached this clearing, this guy had wanted to go right across. I wanted to go around it, but anyway, we he uh, said we don't have time, so we went right across, and in the middle of that thing, we could hear the dive bombers, and I looked up, and I saw this thing coming down, and I, I didn't know what it was, it was round, and all the others I'd seen were long, and then it dawned on me, but that thing was heading right for me, <laughs> so I just squatted, I mean, I just flat on the ground as I could be, and the bomb hit so close that uh, the shrapnel went over me, and uh, it did uh, kill two of them then for the back. And uh, they were in the thickets back there and didn't couldn't see. And uh, it injured uh, several others. So that was one of your close calls? I would say so, yeah. <laughs> On the 9th, uh, General King surrendered. Uh, could you describe the morale of the American troops before the surrender, those last few days? Uh, what kept you guys going? Well, of course, a retreat is not a morale-building uh, maneuver. Uh, it was referred to as a strategic withdrawal, but uh, it doesn't take you very long to figure that out. And uh, they knew, I mean, the average soldier knows pretty well what's going on. And uh, so as we were on the retreat, naturally we were walking at night and day. and. Uh, the morale, I, I don't know the morale was so bad, but uh, it was just uh, utter, uh, utter uh, exhaustion almost. So you, you felt like at times you could just drop and just lay down oh, and yeah, sleep we, for a long Oh yeah, I remember time. one night we were walking back and that was the night of the 8th and uh, we decided why don't we just take a, about an hour of sleep. <laughs> <laughs> so we lay down and, and I don't remember who kept time. But uh, after a while, we got up and went on. Most troops thought that help was coming. Is that true? Oh, yes. We always thought the Yanks were coming. And um, the radio reports that we had uh, coming off Corregidor was uh, verifying that. And I don't think that they would dare say otherwise. So you expected any day to hear that reinforcements had arrived and you guys were Oh, going I expected the Yanks to come every all the way through prisoner of war camp. I never did give them more than three months. And then when that was up, I'd give them three more. And that's, that's sort of how you kept going, wasn't it? I think so. Well, was that a shock to you when you suddenly learned that you were going to surrender? Well, um, we were retreating and uh, along this uh, trail, and I think that's Trail 20, and um, I came on up on this group of Filipino soldiers, an American officer. And I asked him what was the situation. He said, well, the Japanese are behind you and the Japanese are in front of you. And he said that General King has requested a surrender and it has been granted and that will become effective uh, at 11 o'clock this morning. And I said, well, uh, what are you going to do? And he said, well, I'm gonna say right here and I say, well, what would you do if, in my case? He said, I don't know. I was, that's, not, that's your problem. But he said, if you want to, you could pull your men off and let the, the Japanese come through. Well, that's sort of a shocking thing, but uh, we knew that they were right on our tails for the last two days anyway, so uh, we pulled over. Uh, we w walked down in this gully, a big gully, and... Uh, it wasn't very long until the tanks came through and they were firing uh, their machine guns and everything, making quite a bit of noise. Everything quieted down. But when I told the men that they, that we were going to do that, and they said, why? And I said, well, uh, General King has uh, surrendered. Well, some cried, uh, shed tears. Others uh, continued to tell jokes. Uh, and some of them just fell asleep like they wanted to. Most of them did go to sleep. In some accounts of, of that period, stories are told that men took off into the jungles and, and were determined to fight on. Did you see any evidence of that? 
I, I saw no particular evidence of it in my particular group. Uh, now, whether or not anyone from my group, or my, the group of men that I was with, whether or not they took off the jungle, I don't know. Um, some of the squadron were able to make it on to Corregidor, some of the men. Um, but uh, I think most of them were realistic. They knew pretty well what was going to happen. What type of feelings did you have uh, in terms of what to expect from the Japanese? We didn't know what to expect. Uh, going through my mind, I assumed that we would probably be put in a jail somewhere, and uh, it never occurred to me that uh, we received the treatment that we did receive. Do you think more men might have fought on if they knew w what was ahead for them, so many of them were to die anyway? I, I don't know, but probably. But uh, here again, we were out of uh, food. We were out of, uh, pretty well out of supplies. Uh, we were out of food. And uh, you were exhausted mentally and physically, weren't you? Mentally and physically, we were exhausted, yes. Well, tell us the uh, events that occurred immediately when you were captured, the first real contact with the Japanese. How did they treat you and what took place? Well. After we stayed in this uh, gully for a while, and uh, uh, Lieutenant and I, uh, we discussed what we are going to do, and I said, well, maybe we ought to go up and see what's, what's happening. So we went up, and uh, we looked, saw a group of uh, soldiers down under a mango tree, and we thought they were Filipinos. And uh, so we were walking down, and of course we had our white towels, and we felt sort of ridiculous carrying those, but we thought it'd be a safety measure too. And uh, these, uh, and I had never seen a Japanese soldier that close, of course. And uh, when they saw us, they came charging up to us, and I didn't know what to happen. <laughs> I was, I was, uh, I don't, I don't remember exactly what went through my mind, but it wasn't a pleasing sight. But the main thing they were wanting, they were racing up there to get my wristwatch. And uh, they got my wristwatch, fountain pen, and things like that. So they I had a, oh, I had a, a package of Lucky Strike cigarettes, and by gosh, uh, one took that and gave me some Filipinos, and then another one came along and took the, uh, the Filipino cigarettes. So, uh, did you see any rough treatment of your men in the beginning? Not at that time, no. They basically were interested in what you had with you. That's what they were primarily interested in, yeah. What kind of condition would you say the Japanese soldiers were in? They'd been through this same intense fighting in the jungle a long time. Uh, some of them in good physical condition. Some of them were uh, sick, uh, uh, feeling bad. They were trailing along. But uh, the Japanese have a pretty strong discipline. And if you don't keep up with the crowd, you get... Uh, they would bop each other on the head with a, a saber uh, in, in the scabbard. Yeah, well, from reading about this, I understand that the Japanese were really tough on their own men, and uh, they were accustomed to heavy workloads and, in, in a sense, brutality from their oh, officers yeah. at yeah. times. I think they had, as I said, it was a high, they had a high discipline. I want to ask you one more question, and then we'll go into the march aspect of it. What type of weapons were you carrying at the time you surrendered? Well, time personally, I had a 45, uh, which is a government issue uh, pistol, uh, and uh, I think it held about seven rounds, something like that. Most of your men carrying the old Springfield rifle. They were carrying Springfield rifle. We did have a machine gun, a BAR, they call it. That's well, a Browning automatic rifle. The next part I'd like for us to discuss is the death march, which I'm sure many people have heard of in some form or fashion, but that march can be misleading to some people, uh, I believe, because some men on there received fairly decent treatment and then others were subjected to all types of horrors and brutality. Where were you in the march and where did it begin for you? Well, we uh, were back in the jungle and, uh, as I said, we were on Trail 20. And uh, we uh, followed the Japanese out, their instructions. <laughs> and uh, when we got out to the uh, highway, which was the one that went from Marbella's up to San Fernando, uh, they turned us over to another group. 
And that group was out on a, it looked like a parking lot. And uh, it was getting pretty close to sundown, and that was the first night's sleep that I'd had in, since the night of the uh, 6th. They give you any water, food? No, well, they didn't give us any water. In fact, somewhere along the line, I lost my canteen. I think some. <laughs> so uh, I didn't have any water. Now, as the uh, march progressed, uh, we started the next day uh, about sundown on the march. Did they move you along quickly, or did you have rest periods? Well, we walked along, uh, I'd say, at a pretty good pace. And uh, that afternoon, we, we were not very far from a little place called Cab Cabin. And uh, we were uphill from Cab Cabin. You were headed for a railroad junction called San Fernando, I believe. Yes, we were headed for San Fernando, which was about 60 kilometers. No, 100 kilometers. That was about 60 miles. So you were in for a good 60-mile walk. Yeah. Now, as you progressed along the trail, did you see any signs of brutality uh, taking place? Not a great deal. Uh, we were startled uh, sometimes when uh, we were along, along that... Uh, coast of Manila Bay, uh, there's a lot of artesian wells. The U.S. Health Department had put those in, I don't know, in the early part of the century. Uh, and when we were walking along, we'd come to one of those, and if we were in order, and we were in columns of four, and go up and fill our canteens, but if somebody in the rear would break their ranks and come up there, then the whole group had to go move. And uh, we just, so we we found out right quick you know, how to how to handle that. In other words, let's be orderly and get a mouth whipped. So your group was able to maintain order within the ranks. I think that we were pretty far in as far as the uh, head of the line. We were pretty close to the head of it. Most stories the are, marchers coming out. Most accounts seem to indicate that if you were up in the front of the march, yeah. you, you uh, received a better treatment than those that came along later. There were some of those fellows that came in later from their stories. They must have really treated, received some much worse treatment. We but did. you never saw men pulled out of line and shot, bayoneted, or any of those? No. Uh, I've, I've seen people get hit over the head with a bamboo pole, but here again, he was sort of sniffing around trying to get some uh, food somewhere. And we had a Filipino expression called quanning, <laughs> looking for something. What happened to your helmet on the march? I don't know. Somewhere along the line, I heaved that thing over into the field. I, I don't know what happened to it. I read that most of them immediately got rid of their helmets because the Japanese had a habit of coming by and hitting people in the head with their rifle butts if you yeah, had a helmet on. That, that's about the way it was, I think. So everybody learned to get rid of their helmet yeah. in a hurry. And then, of course, the sun was blazing down on you, and there was very little water. Very little water. I mean, uh, of course, as we would walk along, uh, I might say that as far as water was concerned, uh, uh, I think it was the long latter part of the tent. Um, there was a Filipino with an American canteen, and I told him that I didn't have one, and I needed one awfully very bad, and maybe I would, would he give it to me, and he gave it to me. And uh, so I was able from then on to have uh, water. How long were you on the march? Two days, three? No, I, I think it extended for about five days. Five days? How many times do you think you were fed on that march, just in a round number? I have an account of it uh, in a report that I filled out pretty soon after I got back, but uh, we would get a rice ball, which is about the size of an orange, I guess, a small orange. <laughs> a rice ball is nothing more than rice just packed together. You can get one a day, maybe? Sometimes two a day, sometimes three a day, sometimes one a day, sometimes none. So, uh, so you did go a day or two yeah, without anything. That's right. What about the water? That was sporadically uh, rationed to you fellows? Uh, after we got organized in my group, uh, and we had come to these artesian wells, we were able to fill our canteens, and I would say we had a good canteen of water a day, which is uh, sufficient.
the accounts uh, state that all the guards were not Japanese, and some were from Taiwan, and some were from Korea. Do you remember anything about your guards? At that particular time, I didn't know the difference between the Korean uh, uh, and the Japanese. Uh, they could have been some in my group that were Korean, but uh, I didn't. I didn't know. But basically, if your group stuck to the march and uh, did what they were supposed to, there was very little ill treatment. That generally is about the way it was. The main thing, I think, uh, the ordeal of the thing was the, it's, it, April is the hottest month of the year, we, as I said earlier. And I suspect the temperature must have gotten well over 100 degrees on each one of those days. And uh, without water, or a limited amount of water, and what we tried to do is prevent uh, dehydration. But, uh, and then continually walking on uh, very little food. Uh, it was very tiring. What did you have with you? Any clothes, a toothbrush, anything? Well, I had this musette bag uh, with me, and uh, then I had that Bible there. So, uh, so these two items right here survived the war. You kept yeah, these with you all. Yeah, that's amazing. This, this is a musette bag that has my name on it. And uh, this is the Bible, and my wife uh, put that in my trunk before we left uh, Savannah. And uh, so that survived uh, the uh, war. You had uh, iodine with you, I believe. Some, uh, quite a few of the men came down with dysentery. Yes, uh, one of the uh, sergeants uh, asked me. Um, he said that. Yeah, what my opinion was, you and I, and he had uh, heard that uh, that then water would uh, act as a purifier. And I said, well, let's try it. It's better than dysentery. So uh, <laughs> we had put about a drop in a canteen. Now, a canteen holds, I guess, about, I, I'd, I'd say roughly maybe a quart, maybe a little over a quart. So a drop each yeah, being a, canteen. It, it made it a little bit better, but that's better than... Uh, so you having, didn't come down with dysentery? No, I didn't have it. Did quite a few men in your group come down quite with Quite a that? few did, yes. Well, that made it even tougher for them to try to keep up. Oh, yes. Well, they what happened with those that couldn't keep up? Did you start having trouble toward the end with that problem? Now, we didn't have anyone in our particular group of about 100 that didn't uh, make it. Uh, in other words, we would help them along. And, uh, but... Uh, from what I heard and what I've read, uh, a lot of people were being at it or shot when they would fall out. And actually, taking into consideration the uh, that samurai attitude, uh, I don't think it was cruelty they had in mind. It's sort of like uh, us shooting a dog or something, get it down, an injured dog or something. Uh, here's an individual, just get him out of his misery. And uh, so I don't have an oriental mind, but. Uh, Neither do, uh, I mean, I do understand to some extent uh, that way of thinking. Well, let's talk a little bit more about the Japanese attitude towards surrender. Uh, basically, they didn't believe in it, and they perhaps looked down on those who did. Is that a correct statement? Uh, the Japanese, uh, the philosophy, the old samurai for the philosophy, uh, no surrender. Uh, they would fight to the last. And that was particularly true in the beginning of the, oh, along towards the early part of the war. Uh, as time went on, I think it slackened some, but uh, even so, uh, they would uh, not uh, surrender. And they were surprised at us, and they could understand. Now here again, here's a, an Oriental mind trying to think what an Occidental mind is thinking, and uh, vice versa. And they are quite different. They expected you to commit suicide? Certainly not to surrender. <laughs> <laughs> and you think they lost respect for you because you did surrender? Oh, I don't know that they lost. Uh, it could be. I don't think they had a whole lot of respect for us anyway. Uh, I, I don't. I don't know what they were thinking. <laughs> Some people I've read have called World War II, in a sense, sort of a race war between the Japanese and, and the Americans. Do you think that's an exaggeration? Oh, I know. I wouldn't. Uh, I wouldn't think of it as that. I don't think that was a main issue. 
I think the Japanese were expanding. They wanted to expand. And I think that they thought that uh, in Europe for years, uh, they had expanded by using warfare. So they copied it. <clears throat> and they had, of course, <coughs> accumulated uh, quite a bit of property, Manchuria and a lot of China. Well, back on the march, you finally arrived after five days at the rail center. And I would assume you at least temporarily felt some relief with the notion that you were going to get to ride the train. Well, when we got to uh, San Fernando, they put us in a schoolyard that uh, quite dusty, but uh, at least we were fed rice uh, three times a day, and we got uh, these these world uh, pr these canteens wouldn't didn't hold a whole lot, but we got about a half canteen each serving, and uh, that uh, that helped us out. Some and in other words, it made us feel a little bit better. Except those that had dysentery and they even got worse. So some men were really going down fast. Yeah, they were. Again, referring to such books as Donald Knox's book, The Death March, he states in there that a lot of men died on those trains because they were packed in there so tightly. Uh, could you describe what you knew about that? Well, the situation uh, that. And that train car was a very a rather, relatively small in comparison to the ones that we have here. It's probably about half the size of the regular uh, train car we have. And they were made of steel. Uh, and so when they would put a hundred men or more in there and pack it full and then close the door uh, to travel from there up to uh, Capus, it, it would it'd be very hot. In my particular car, and I don't know how often this happened, uh, the Japanese guard was on the inside, and after the train got started, he opened the door. <laughs> and I guess after after all, he didn't he didn't want to suffer himself. So uh, I believe our time's about up. Ted, you're a remarkable story, and I want to thank you for sharing it with us. And this is Bob Bullen reminding you that if you'd like to look into the future, you need only to listen to the voices of the past. Welcome to Recollections, the Middle Tennessee Voice of Their Time series, a look at the past through the experiences of Middle Tennesseans. This is Bob Bullen of Middle Tennessee State University, and our guest is Theodore C. Bigger, retired college professor, World War II veteran, survivor of the Bataan Death March, and survivor of the Japanese prisoner of war camps in the Philippine Islands. This is a story of the human will to survive. Ted, welcome to the program. You arrived at Camp O'Donnell. That was the destination. Could you describe what happened then? Well, we uh, got off the train at a little place called Capas, C-A-P-A-S, and then we had to walk about uh, four or five miles to O'Donnell. Philippine, I call that O'Donnell. But anyway, uh, we were given a speech by the commander and it was all in uh, Japanese language, but they had an interpreter. And uh, some of the things that he told us was uh, that uh, the war would go on for a hundred years. If they hadn't won it, then go on a thousand. <laughs> that they would win the war. Uh, and uh, another thing was about uh, people escaping. In other words, that no one should uh, attempt to escape. Because if it did, uh, then ten men would uh, would be shot for one man. And there was a list of things. Uh, I don't remember exactly what 
and they included, but uh, he named them all. Donald Knox, in his book, Death March, describes the camp as a, as a terrible place to be, that uh, the death rate went from 50 up to nearly 100 a day. And Could you tell us about it? I think that was true. I uh, I was there. Um, I don't recall whether, I guess I was some of the advanced group, probably some of the first when I got there. But uh, as time went on, uh, uh, the death rate did increase. Uh, uh, the food was better than it uh, had been, of course. We, we were fed uh, three times a day even though the known day meal was mostly watery soup and that type of stuff. And now by soup, I'm not talking about, I would be making uh, soup out of uh, sweet potato tops and that stuff boiled up in, uh, in the water. Um, I think that the uh, death rate, at the time I left, uh, I went out on a bridge building detail, <coughs> but time that I left, it was about uh, 50 men a day, maybe maybe 100 men of Americans, and about four or five times that many for Filipinos. Filipinos received worse treatment, or they, they seem to die in larger numbers. It was a matter of uh, them uh, dying. They had been back in the jungles. They had malaria. They had dysentery, and uh, they died off a uh, terrific death rate. So our men were coming down with all kind of physical ailments now, berry, berry, dysentery, uh, starvation was setting in. You made up your mind to get out of that camp, didn't you? Well, one of the, yes, I wanted to, uh, to improve the situation if I could. And uh, when Corregidor fell on uh, May 6th, uh, then they started sending out uh, groups to... Uh, clean up all of the um, equipment that they could get. In other words, everything, they scrap a metal and that type of thing, put it on boats and send it to Japan. And so I volunteered for one of those things. Actually, there's no volunteer. The only thing I had to do was just go down to the, a certain location and uh, then they would uh, call you in. So, uh, and that amounted to just lining up and uh, being counted off. And uh, the group that I went with, there was about 150 of us. There were three officers and uh, 147 men. And we wound up uh, south of Manila, around the uh, Laguna de Bay, a little place called Lumban. And we built a bridge uh, for them there that had been, uh, of course, when American forces were retreating, they blew up the bridge. So then we put this uh, wooden bridge across. Did you see a lot of brutality in that camp? That particular camp was uh, not too well, there was no, no brutality in a way, uh, except, I mean, and these were mostly carpenters in that type of thing. And, uh, but uh, I've forgotten the day, I think it was June 11th, uh, the... Uh, I believe it was that night of June 11th that there was a, a group of uh, guerrillas came in, shot up the guards, and one man out of our group escaped. And the next day, uh, they lined us all up, and uh, out of that group they selected 10, and they were shot, and we had to witness it. And uh, it was a very uh, trying ordeal. I, I recall one thing uh, as far as I, I didn't realize at the time, but I had I had reached up and pulled out a handful of hair out of my head, and I didn't even feel it. Did you know the men? Uh, well, I didn't know them personally, but after all, they were Americans and uh, American soldiers, and and uh, they were awfully close to us. And uh, I don't know, it 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 shook us all up. Were you better off on the work detail than being in the camp? Yes. That we got more food. In other words, if you worked, you'd get food. But no work, no food. Well, or you're less food. You're settling into uh, some sort of routine now as a prisoner of war. Could you just describe what life was like, a daily routine? And 
after you we co well after we completed that bridge, we were sent uh, to Cabana to Juan, uh, which is uh, north of Manila, on the island of Luzon, and uh, I was placed there. Uh, all the people from Corregidor were there, and they they had food. They looked good. Of course, they had been on good ration longer. Even though they were on the half ration, they still had good ration. Yes, we need to explain, I think, that Corregidor surrendered in May. That, yes, and, May the 6th. So you people had already been in, in prison for about a month. A month and, about a month. And really, about those, those men had better conditions on Corregidor, if such a thing could be said, than than the men on Bataan. Well, they had a rough time because they, they had, uh, uh, they were really blasted almost out of the, uh, uh, off the face of the earth, you might say, but be that as it may, uh, uh, they had had uh, American food and they had had pretty good food and they had not been on that uh, death rice march. Dar and yes, they had not been on death march and had not been on that uh, uh, rice diet. Many of those men are quoted as being shocked when they saw the condition that your group was in. That, that's what they said. Uh, they they wanted to know what 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 had happened and of course we couldn't explain everything but uh, and I was at Cabana Tawan there for a re uh, well long in the summer uh, I, I guess that I went there I believe that when I was delivered to Cabana Tawan by the Japanese was uh, along about the first of July first week in July and then uh, we were there until uh, along in October. And uh, there was another detail going out. And I'm, I was one always to keep on moving. I'd try most anything out. And I knew this one was going to Davao, uh, which is on the southernmost island of Mindanao. And uh, that's about five or 600 miles south of uh, Manila. And we were taken by boat, and uh, I've forgotten, I believe it's about a 10-day trip. They would go to different places, uh, take off supplies and leave them, and go to another one. And of course, between Manila or, and uh, Davao, there were a lot of islands all in through there. And uh, those of uh, people who are acquainted with the General MacArthur return, uh, Leite is one of them, of course. And uh, but when we got to Davao, uh, we had to walk out to uh, out of town about, uh, oh, I guess about 25, 30 miles, to a place uh, that they call the Davao Penal Colony. And uh, th there, uh, they had uh, a lot of things going on. Uh, of course, there were no inmates. All the Filipinos had taken to the woods, and uh, a lot of the gar uh, Philippine guards had taken to the woods. But uh, when we got there, they uh, they arranged us in different. They had, we had rice details. We had details to go out and uh, plant commodi uh, commodities, they call it. It's a really sweet potatoes and uh, plant cassava, harvest cassava, things of that nature, all types of work. That, that prison camp was basically devoted to raising vegetables and food for the Japanese army. Yes, that's, that's what I understand. And so you people ate perhaps a little bit better than some prisoners in other camps? Well, oddly enough, we probably didn't. Uh, I don't know, we had plenty of food there, but uh, all of the tropical food uh, on the outside of the wire fence, uh, we didn't really get any of it unless we were happen to be out in the uh, uh, d some some type of a detail out there, like uh, picking kapok, which is uh, making life guards, or various other things. Well, uh, I guess that brings us to a point we mentioned earlier in our discussion. You did eat roaches. Yeah. Uh, I don't know whether it was at Davao or not, but uh, it was at Davao on a rice detail that I got involved with a snake, and uh, we were harvesting it, and uh, the method that we were harvesting was just use a little old sickle 
which is uh, it's a curve type thing. And you just take that thing and cut off some uh, rice and put it down. And uh, after you get it enough there, you make it into a bundle. And this snake stuck his head up and I cut it off. <laughs> Uh, first fell uh, sort of for protection, but I had seen the Japanese skin snakes and uh, eat them, so I just uh, wrapped that son of a gun around my uh, in my clothes and took him on in, and we had him for supper. Did you cook him? Yep. What it tastes like? Well, it tastes pretty good. <laughs> Man, it's hungry. Just about <laughs> anything tastes good. Protein is protein. That's exactly right. Well. Something must have kept you fellows going. Uh, a lot of men gave up, willed themselves to death, as some accounts said. But a lot of you that survived, you seem to have a positive attitude. Uh, how did you keep that positive attitude working? Uh, of course, as far as the death rate at Deval, it was less than it was either at Cabana Tuan or at uh, O'Donnell. O'Donnell. It, uh, and uh, believe it or not, we got a Red Cross package of I guess it'd be for the Christmas of 42, but it came in 43, along in January. And uh, I didn't realize that uh, Spam would taste so good. <laughs> what all was in those packages? I'm surprised that any packages were allowed to come through. Well, uh, they had the various things, but uh, most of it things like Spam and uh, some butter and uh, things of that nature. Cigarettes? Yes, it was cigarettes. Cigarettes yeah. became a form of barter or exchange, I believe. Yes. Uh, a lot of people could trade. Uh, uh, they would for for a cigarette. They'd give you, you know, rice ration, and that's getting pretty. That's when you're giving away your food uh, for smoke. That's pretty. That's pretty bad. And some men uh, were gambling. I, ha I have seen that done. They were really gambling future meals on obtaining oh, something yeah. else. Yeah. Yeah. Were things smuggled into the camp from guerrillas or civilians? Now, that did not happen at Davao. That did happen in Cabana Tuan. Uh, but it was mostly after I had left. Uh, but in talking to those fellows up there at Cabana Tuan, that uh, the Filipinos uh, had a very efficient uh, organization in which they got food in and medicine. What was your relationship with guards at this time? Well, it wasn't too bad, of course. I, I soon found out that uh, with the Japanese, uh, they're good guys and bad guys, just like they are with uh, everybody else. So uh, there's a lot of them. I know that the officers there at Davao, uh, uh, particularly one, I'm uh, well by the name of Yuki. That's all I know about him, and Yuki. But he was he was a Christian and a very good man. He didn't he had to be secretive about telling him about his religion. But uh, he was, uh, and I like him sometimes. Did officers, did American officers get any better treatment? No. Oh, no, about the not, same. Not, 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 not a general rule. Now, they may have in some cases. Did you see any of our men collaborating with the Japanese to get a better uh, rice allotment or a little better treatment? Did much of that go on in the camps? That no, you they, they didn't get away with that too much. I mean, I don't know. The Japanese, uh, uh, in that respect, would, uh, I don't think they did too much for favorites. Now, some people may have. Now, those fellows are working in the Jap kitchen, uh, KPs, or kitchen police, as they call. Uh, that naturally, they would get better food, because they'd be right there, and they could, they could get it one way or the other. <laughs> Some men became very desperate in the effort to survive, and in in I've read accounts where our men were really kind of hardened or harsh toward their fellow prisoners, and, and, and you almost had to do that to survive. Is there much truth to that type of a statement? I think it would depend on the <clears throat> circumstances or the instance. Um, on some of the boats, which later, when the Japanese were trying to get the boats to... Uh, uh, get the prisoners from the Philippines up to uh, Japan. The American uh, submarines and later the uh, dive bombers uh, sank a lot of them. And there were a lot of people, a lot of the men that died in that way. 
you were fortunate in one instance that your physical condition probably saved you from being sent to Japan. That happened at Davao. I had, uh, I started having uh, a seizure, so it's blacking out. And uh, I don't know what caused it. It could have been one of two or three things. But uh, the Japanese uh, did not want anybody that was uh, crazy, and they sort of thought I was. Uh, that uh, activity was uh, an indicator. Neither did they want anyone with tur tuberculosis or TB. So that helped you out then? I think so. Did you I have a spinal tap I remember reading in yes. the book? Yeah. Would you talk about that a little bit, what happened there? Well, these... Uh, seizures that I was talking about resulted uh, after, I mean, along association with severe headaches and that's what happened first. I had these very severe headaches and after the seizure the doctors uh, assumed that I had pressure on the spine and they uh, they uh, took that when they would relieve the pressure they'd take out some of the spinal fluid, and uh, that would relieve the pressure on my uh, brain, I guess, and uh, relieve the headaches. And it would prevent the seizures for a while. Did you have any of that problem after the war? I had one attack, and uh, that was when I was in the hospital at White Oak Springs. That was Ashford General Hospital. Did you have any uh, medication much when they put you through that spinal tap procedure? I don't know whether they gave me a uh, anything or not before they stuck the needle through. I uh, I don't, I just don't remember. Just they just told of, me not to move. <laughs> it's just sort of a hazy memory then. Yeah. Describe your other physical ailments as a result of your captivity. Well, of course, all of us had uh, berry berry to some extent. Some of them had it more, w even worse than I others. I think we probably ought to state what berry berry means. Well, berry berry uh, is a terrific uh, ache in the feet starts with the feet it can be in the hands and uh, they had two kinds one of them was a wet and one was a dry and now in the wet berry berry they collect fluids and apparently uh, I don't know what the kidney is not working somewhere or other. but uh, but berry berry is a ailment that attributed to lack of vitamin B1 and uh, I still take vitamin B1. I think it does me some good. Yeah. You had some eyesight problems. I had, uh, at one time, I was seeing double. And we got some Red Cross packages in. Uh, that would be for the year of 43, but they came in long in January of 44. And so my, I still have a little scar tissue back in my eyes, but uh, it but at the time, that I could, I had gotten a letter from home, and I couldn't read it. But after that Red Cross package came in, now the what we received, uh, the amount we received about two boxes per individual. The second shipment, I think, is a box of a half. In other words, two men had to split a box. You sent some postcards home. The Japanese let you send some. Well, I wouldn't call them postcards necessarily. Well, how would you describe it? Well, it was uh, on a, a cardboard-like thing, and it had uh, messages, for instance, uh, I am at least uh, excellent health, uh, poor, good, and that kind of thing. And you were supposed to circle the one that you were uh, attributed to your underscore. And... Uh, you could add uh, certain things there, but it had to be so many letters, and you couldn't go in beyond that. I believe you told your wife on one of them that you, to keep up the car payments or something of that nature, insurance payments. Yeah. Uh, see that my uh, blank. See that my insurance uh, payments are kept up, and my car is kept grease and well and, and the last part was written with the Japanese is taken care of <laughs> well that showed your optimism you you were sure you're going to get out or you had high hopes that you were going to live through this ordeal uh, I hope so yeah 
you put yourself or you aligned yourself with other men with the same type of thinking, I believe you told me that that, that, that helped get through by finding other men with a positive attitude. Well, I soon found out a pessimist or someone that uh, said, woe is us, uh, I don't think we'll make it, uh, wasn't very long that he was being buried. So uh, the best thing to do is to uh, be crack jokes and Were you ever on any... <laughs> Miss the women, I'm sure. I might say by talking about the girls that uh, rather than talking about the girls, these fellows were talking, uh, making recipes. They would start out with rice and then they would add all these various ingredients to it. Red Cross packages came in and pretty soon they were talking about girls again. And as soon as the Red Cross packages gave out, they'd go back to writing recipes. Recipes was a form of recreation. What about singing? Any type of organized singing take place? Well, we had uh, some... Uh, Rice songs, uh, songs that we sang out in the rice patty, but uh, I don't know whether I could quote any of those <laughs> or not. <laughs> One of them started off sort of uh, planting rice is lots of fun out in the midday sun, and it goes on. I think that uh, because of your health, you were finally sent to Billabid Prison in uh, well, that, Manila. All of that camp was uh, transferred out. From uh, Davao, and we were shipped north. Uh, and I, we got into uh, Manila along about the middle of June of '44, and I was put into Billabid Prison. It's a uh, an old pr prison that Spanish built when they were there, and uh, double wall thing, and uh, it was sort of a hospital. Dark, gloomy, and damp. No. No, it was open. Um, uh, we could uh, go on the outside and outside the building. It had buildings very much about like a barn. Much brutality there? Not a great deal that I know of. In other words, if somebody was did something that he wasn't supposed to, he would get put, in a, he might be put in a hooskow, but... Uh, because of the threat to shoot people, most of you uh, put aside the idea of trying to yeah, escape. I think most people did because, after all, we were 10,000 miles away from home and uh, nothing to float in but your best kit, and that's not a very good boat. Let's talk a little bit more about your health. Uh, what about your teeth? How did how, how'd you keep your teeth clean? Well, uh, I had a, on the death march, I picked up a, a toothbrush somewhere along the line. Somebody had dropped or thrown away. And I, and I still had it when I was liberated. And we didn't have any tooth polish, um, tooth, anything like that. Uh, but as I recall, it, we did get an issue of some stuff. It looked about like, uh, well, it was fine, but uh, in brushing your teeth, it would really make it shine in a hurry. And so we assumed that it would had some abrasive effect, and so we didn't use a great deal of it. Any body sores? Any body sores? That type of skin conditions? Uh, yeah, fungus? Uh, tropical diseases, uh, tropical things. Uh, well, you, you've named them off beriberi and pellagra and uh, scurvy and um, not a, not maybe not in much scurvy, but uh, well, I believe that's in the, where you, we've probably yeah. had some. You had some combination of most of these at one time or another. Some of those malnutrition ailments, I think I had it. All right. Let's backtrack a bit. When you arrived in the Philippines in 1941, how much did you weigh? I weighed about 150, 55, something like that. In good physical condition. Yeah. How much did you weigh when you were finally liberated? I think I uh, weighed about... Uh, it must have been pretty close, around 100 pounds, I think. Uh, we had, uh, and I, as I recall, it was about 100 pounds. But some men who were bigger in frame and bigger, uh, bigger boned and so forth, they they lost uh, up to 100 pounds. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. So you saw some. We real... all, yeah, we we all got down pretty close to 100 pounds, well, regardless of what we started off with. There was a movement to send a lot of prisoners to Japan, and as we discussed, because of your seizures, you you were saved from that aspect of it. Uh, would you find anything that was really different from one prison to another as you were moved about? You ended up in four prisons. 
Yeah. I, they were roughly about all the same, but here again, it would depend entirely on the individual uh, Japanese commander or the Japanese guard. So some of them uh, could be awfully tough, and some of them uh, had some not too bad. And Bill Beard, it, uh, it was right there in Manila. They had source of food, and they used a lot of it, took advantage of it. When did you have an inclination that the war may be coming to an end and, it, and that you might be liberated? Let's talk about that. A oh, bit. one morning we were sitting there in Bill Beard and we heard the planes coming, and uh, I hadn't heard an American plane uh, since uh, the latter part of uh, 41, and uh, I heard these planes coming, and they, everybody else looked at each other, and we knew that there were American planes, and it was Navy. And the Navy, and I think that was long in the middle of September of 1944. When were you liberated? I was liberated February the 4th of 1945. Could you tell us what happened at that time, your feelings and how that came about? Well, on the night of the 3rd, uh, we heard these tanks coming, eh? and uh, they came in and had one whale of a big battle on the outside of the wall. And uh, along about midnight, they... Uh, Quiet, everything quieted down, so we thought Gaishi came in, shot up the town, and gone home. But, uh, and the next morning, the Japanese guard was still there, and we didn't know what had happened. And uh, so we waited along about 11 o'clock. The Japanese, uh, in pomp and circumstance, came around, relieved all guards, but didn't leave one. They just uh, picked up the guard and, in military fashion, went on out and they went out the gate and they left a message telling us, or he had written, that uh, we were free, but they advised not to go out on the street because there was some shooting, because we knew that. Did you expect to be killed at the end? No, I hadn't uh, given it a great deal of thought. I wouldn't have been surprised had they uh, attempted that type of thing, but uh, here again, I, I don't know. Uh, that did happen in some, a lot of cases. How much longer do you think you could have lasted under those conditions? Well, it, the conditions like it was at uh, Billabid, I probably could have gone on a good long while. Good long while. Yeah. Well, we've covered a lot about prison life. Is there anything that you would like to comment on that we haven't covered so far in, in terms of what took place in prison? Well, of course, uh, the first um, meal that I got uh, uh, was uh, from a... Uh, American, uh, the one, the, re the people that came in, it was the, uh, the Ohio National Guard outfit. Uh, I, I think, I've forgotten now, the Roger Young Regiment, I know, I remember that. But uh, they had uh, 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 some breakfast food there. It was uh, cream of wheat. And this fellow really put on the sugar. And I ate that, and I could feel the uh, sugar going through my uh, veins. It was about like taking a good, a strong drink of alcohol. You could just feel that going right on. So what happened after you were liberated? Did you have adjustment problems? or? No, when, we, when the Japanese guards left out, we immediately started uh, cooking rice ourselves. We had rice every hour on the row. So we were so stuffed full of rice when the Americans came in along about four o'clock that afternoon, we were uh, we were pretty well stuffed with rice. And they didn't have anything to give us anyway because those were front line troops. They didn't have the traditional American Hershey bar? Mm, I don't know whether they did not. <laughs> So uh, you guys were, I'm sure, were excited and elated to finally be free. How long did it take for them to start the processing, you fellows, in terms of medical treatment and plans to go Well, home? it didn't take too long. Uh, the dates that, uh, in my memory, we were taken by truck uh, out of Manila up to Lingan Gulf, which is about 100 miles. Uh, then we flew down to Leyte. And we were there and processed there for a while. And the day before we got on the boat, uh, got another promotion. Uh, General MacArthur had uh, promoted everybody that he could. So you were so a major. I was, major I was a major. They promoted me from captain to major. We got on the boat. Uh, 
about the 22nd, uh, maybe been 25th, about the middle of uh, February. And uh, we got into, we went down to uh, Hollandia, New Guinea, stayed there two or three nights. I went off the boat about four or five steps, looked back, and I said, we might pull the gang plank, and I got back on the boat. <laughs> so uh, we got into San Francisco on the uh, 16th of uh, March, 1945. Was your wife there to greet you? Not there immediately. Uh, I was put into the hospital there and uh, was on the, and in bed uh, long about, I don't know, sometime after supper. And they told me I had a visitor. Well, I didn't know who was going to visit me and I had my wife. <laughs> well, could you share those feelings that you had seeing your wife for the first time in, what, four years or long? I was uh, totally surprised because I didn't expect her to be there in San Francisco, but she had flown out. and. Uh, she got in a little bit late, but uh, I was glad to see her. You gained 32 or 33 pounds in just a couple of months? I think so, yeah. I I know that on the boat I gained about a pound a day. They were feeding us three times a day. By that time, we were pretty well uh, geared ourselves where we could handle American food. Obviously, having survived 40 years after all of this, you must have come out of that in fairly good condition. Well, uh, I still have uh, problems with that old uh, thing that caused me to have seizures, and and I always held me back in my work. In other words, if I worked too hard uh, and stuck at it too too long, uh, I would I would have these faint uh, symptoms, and uh, that would give me an indication I was better slow down. You went back in 1981 to visit. Went back to Manila, took my wife back to Manila in 1981. When we were there in 41, the city of Manila was about 70,000. Now it's about 7 million. I believe our time's about up. Ted, you're a remarkable story, and I want to thank you for sharing it with us. And this is Bob Bullen reminding you that if you'd like to look into the future, you need only to listen to the voices of the past. Mm -hmm.